Thank you for attending our 21st Century Scholarship event for 2021 on open educational resources. Uh, we'll be chatting with Mark McBride, the Senior Library Strategist from SUNY System Admin. Um, and then Caitlin, Dr. Caitlin Stack Whitney from uh, College of Liberal Arts will be moderating a Q&A afterward. Um, so if you do have questions kind of um, throughout the presentation, you can add them into the Q&A box. And I believe you can also, you should be able to see what everyone else is asking or like upvote, down, add comments if you want to want to build off of someone else's question. Um, I don't think we have any interpreters today. Um, if you would like, I have the live uh, transcription feature turned on so you can, I think you have to enable it for your own viewing. Um, and I think that should be good. So Mark, if you want to get started, I'll stop sharing and you can, uh, you can go. All right. Thank you, Francis. I think everybody can see the slides. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate, uh, being here today with you or, you know, somewhat here with you today. Um, my name is Mark McBride. Um, I work at SUNY System Administration. Um, in the Office of Library and Information Services, you know, and part of my portfolio includes working in a, the shared library services environment. I have a team of people that oversee, um, you know, essentially the library technology for, uh, for all 64 campuses. Uh, we also have an open access repository environment. Um, you know, we're making um, some, you know, some investments in open access, trying to figure out uh, exactly what SUNY's involvement will be in that space. Um, but also, you know, part of the my responsibility is also the OER services. We, we have a team of people dispersed across SUNY uh, that work with our campuses um, to kind of help them, um, you know, meet their expectations for their teaching and learning where open educational resources are concerned. And that's going to be primarily the focus uh, of, of my talk today. I'm going to kind of just give you a, a quick starter on on SUNY system um, and so you know we're 64 campuses um, and as, as you start to look um, at a particular trends where enrollments are concerned you'll see that over the last several years our enrollments have dropped steadily um, and that that kind of coins you know kind of course course corresponds with the declining population inside of New York State, you know, we expect this trend to continue for a while, for a number of years. I mean, we'll probably have a few years where there's some spikes, um, some modest increases, um, but mostly we will see declining uh, enrollments um, and probably changing demographics. So, you know, I, I think our colleges initially were set up um, for that 18 to 25 year old demographic. But that's starting to shift too as we start to see more adult learners um, taking courses and, and pursuing degrees within SUNY. You know, as we start to think about the 64 campuses and think about them in the aggregate, um, you know, you, just to make everybody aware, you know, we're, we're kind of a mixed bag. We're a comprehensive university system. And most of you probably know because most of you are probably from New York State. Um, but it just bears repeating, you know, we're made up of community colleges, colleges of technology, comprehensive colleges, doctoral institutions, and there are also three R1s. Um, you know, our research centers, you know, for the most part, um, their, um, their enrollments have stayed relatively flat, maybe a little bit of an increase. Um, but our uh, comprehensives, they have seen some um, drastic drops in enrollments and, of course, our community colleges as well. You know, and I, you know, I, I kind of set the stage uh, with that so you understand, you know, what where SUNY started to make their investment in OER and, and, and why they saw OER as an important play to kind of combat those shrinking enrollments. Um, you know, for SUNY, OER has been, you know, kind of a strategic initiative um, when we first started working with OER, I think our focus was was strictly on textbook affordability. Um, you know, we've also learned through our work with OER and from some of the research that's out there that you know, you know, OER is 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 also helping with some student retention issues. And as you can imagine, when there's declining enrollments, uh, retention is a big play because you want to keep. Uh, the students that you have as long as you can uh, keep them until they reach their degree. 
Um, but we also saw that OER could have a positive impact on academic achievement. Um, now, I, I think common sense would tell you that, you know, not all OER is going to immediately lead to increase in academic achievement. And so I think initially we thought that access to course materials would uh, equate immediately to student success. Um, while it certainly did save students money, um, you know, we learned that not all OER necessarily um, was going to equate to academic, um, let's say, rigor or academic achievement. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily the fault of OER, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but really, I think the, the, as you start to think of the long tail of the OER story, at least in SUNY, um, you know, faculty development is, is paramount and key. Uh, because I think, you know, helping our faculty um, use their strengths and use the strengths of the people inside their organizations, their libraries, instructional designers, instructional technologists, faculty developers, to help them achieve their goals uh, for their teaching and learning. Um, OER has got enough flexibility where, you know, you can focus on the pedagogy while at the same time making the, the customization to the course materials that a faculty member needs to be more successful in their own uh, teaching strategies. So let me first start by uh, defining OER, and I'll kind of like parse it out into, you know, the, 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 the three letters of the acronym. So, you know, when I'm talking about open, um, you know, OER are, are, are open educational materials um, that can be used for nearly any purpose. Um, and because of the way they are licensed, and OER provides enough flexibility so those changes can be made. Um, and you don't have to worry about any violations to copyright or any violations to any intellectual property. You know, the way uh, uh, an OER is licensed permits someone who chooses to use an OER or implement an OER uh, to, to, to customize the content for their own purposes. Um, you know, OER can be combined with other uh, OERs, so you can take, you know, two uh, OERs, combine them, and now you have a, a, a brand new um, OER that you can, you can teach with and, and customize. Um, but also, you know, with open content, like open textbooks, you, know, you can take the content and you can put it into uh, different platforms, digital platforms, such as adaptive or personalized learning platforms, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So when you think about educational uh, materials, I think with OER, again, I'll, I'll say this repeatedly, that licensing is the key. Um, the way the OER is licensed, it, it, get, it grants you that permission as the user um, to make the, the appropriate changes you need for your own purposes. I mean, you don't have to be saddled with the burden of, of, of copyright or, or try to figure out what is and what isn't fair use. You know, this has been something that I think educators have struggled with for a while. Um, you know, early in my career, when I worked at Buffalo State College, I was a librarian. I was, the, I was responsible for copyright and fair use questions. And honestly, I mean, I, I was kind of like, I, I felt I was definitely pushing to the deep end of the pool. And... Um, and I, I never could really um, properly, I think, address the copyright and fair use questions that a number of faculty members had. Because let's face it, you know, it, it, it's a difficult topic uh, to address. And it's also, it's a, hard, um, it's a hard question to answer if you don't have a legal background. And the last piece I'll talk about are just resources. And this should be somewhat, um, you know, uh, easy to understand. An OER can be software, it can be a textbook, it can be a web application, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, again, it's, 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 it's about the licensing of the material and the material that, you know, that, that you're using for your teaching pur purposes. Well, that's, that essentially is the resource, right? Um, so it's generally recognized that OER can be used for any purpose and, and that, you know, that includes formal and informal learning opportunities. And, I'm, I, I think we're starting to see a lot of the informal taking place, especially in our tutoring spaces uh, and also in some of our maker spaces that we're seeing in a number of our libraries. So, you know, OER is a lot more dynamic than just an open textbook. In SUNY, 
uh, when, you know, we started working um, intensely with OER and trying to really push it out into our curriculum, you know, we wanted to define an OER course. And so defining an OER course for us is where the majority of the course material used um, or required inside of a course um, is openly licensed. Um, and so that may not be the best definition, but it's probably the easiest one for us to use. Uh, because I think there's still some problems in terms of discovering OER or finding quality OER that a faculty member wants to embed inside their course um, because not, um, you know, there's just, there really isn't enough quality OER in the ecosystem at this time. OER continues to grow in popularity. Um, again, you know, it's been identified as a cost-saving solution. I mean, we all know that Higher education is an, uh, under increased pressure um, to lower the cost of education, um, to make it more affordable and accessible to students. Um, textbooks, I, I think, have been identified by students for a number of years as, as one of those expenses um, that they would prefer to live without. Uh, and I think a number of our students are left with the decision to make whether they're going to you know, pay rent, pay their daycare bill, um, uh, buy groceries this week, or pay for a textbook. And I think it's also fair to say that, you know, a number of students have to take out loan um, through financial aid office in order to afford additional expenses, such as course materials and textbooks. Um, so it's, it's a problematic issue. Uh, and I think OER is a, is a, is a good solution. Um, although I don't think it's the, the, the entire solution for the problem, it is something that I think institutions have to take seriously because, you know, the affordability crisis in higher education continues and, and, and remains where it's at. And I think it's even getting worse. And when you start looking at the student loan crisis, um, it, you can draw a de definite correlation between course materials and, and student loan uh, problems. Um, you know, there's 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 growing evidence that um, you know the OER in and itself um, can save students money while also increasing um, not only access to education but also provide them with better learning opportunities. When I believe a faculty member starts to implement uh, a strategy for adopting an OER, so instead of just saying I'm going to take an open textbook and get rid of my Pearson textbook. You, you, a faculty member starts working with instructional designers and librarians and start thinking differently about the way they prepare to teach their course. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, some research we've done at UB that has actually looked at faculty preparation uh, processes with, uh, with OER. So this is where I get to brag a little. Um, in SUNY since 2017, uh, we've had over 600,000 students enrolled in OER courses. Um, so over the last four years, we've, we've just seen an, an, an increase in the number of students taking OER courses. You know, we received the state investment. We've been seeing it annually for about $4 million a year to help expand the use of open educational resources. And in total, that has saved our students around $70 million in textbook costs. Now, that's not straight math, um, to be fair. You know, that's more economic uh, math, if, if you will. Um, so, you know, we're, we're drawing some conclusions based on what we think the average cost for students are, where textbooks are concerned. Um, you know, we've also seen over 2,800 faculty in SUNY teaching with OER. You know, for a little bit of uh, context, we have about 26,000 faculty in, in SUNY. So you can see that's a big number that we're drawing from. And now not all of them are teaching faculty, uh, but still that's 26,000 faculty and, and 2,800 teaching with OER. Now that number continues to grow, but you can see it, it's only a small dent in the entire ecosystem. Um, we are starting to see some positive impact uh, in terms of student learning, uh, student learning outcomes uh, from the courses that where OER has been infused into, into the curriculum. So that, that's also another boon. The pathway for SUNY with OER, you know, it started back in 2011. 
Uh, there was a, a next generation learning grant. It was called the Kaleidoscope Project that started at Tompkins Community College. Um, that's around Ithaca, New York. If people know where uh, Tompkins, Portland is. You know, their idea was if we could provide access to course materials, openly licensed course materials, will students perform better? Um, kind of this access hypothesis. Uh, when Tompkins Cortland started working with OER, they saw, of course, immediate gains in student uh, savings. Um, but, you know, the, the student learning outcomes were a little unbalanced. Some did better, some did worse. Um, but they continued on this methodology and they continued to work with OER and improve their program over time. And it caught the eye of a number of campuses in SUNY. Um, in 2012, SUNY started a program called the Innovative Instruction Technology Grants. Part of that program was that any uh, SUNY faculty member or campus that was funded through this grant uh, would be responsible for openly licensing their content so that other uh, members of the SUNY family and anybody really around the world could easily start to use these you know, artifacts that were developed through the grant. Uh, you know, a moment of, of, of frankness and honesty, we thought clearly about the licensing and we went round and round with our own legal team, but we really didn't know how to collect the artifacts or what to do with the artifacts. And I think that that's kind of parallel with a lot of the problems that we've seen with the Open Act, uh, the OER repository space, that there's a lot of content that's out there, but it, you know, it struggles with metadata classification, it struggles with discoverability, it, it struggles in a number of areas. And so soon you you know, we really kind of tripped over our own two feet on that one. Uh, but nonetheless, we've had a lot of success. And one of the successes we had out of it was out at SUNY Geneseo, which isn't too far from RIT. Uh, there was a program there called the Open SUNY Textbook Project. The idea was that faculty would author open textbooks, making them freely available to students, and that libraries and the librarians would work as the publishing arm for the development of those open textbooks. It was a success. The program still uh, runs now, I believe it's called Milne Open Textbooks now, uh, named after the Geneseo libra the library in Geneseo. Um, that program in itself um, caught the attention of, of a number of campuses in SUNY because not only were we interested in development of open textbook, but I think more importantly, we were really interested in seeing the adoption of existing OER. And so there were a lot of questions about where does one find OER? Um, and so, you know, that, that conversation continues today. Um, again, we were part of a, a, a grant called the Achieving the Dream is about OER degree programs. Uh, we also had a, a group of um, faculty within SUNY. It's a faculty advisory council for teaching and learning. Uh, which is an advisory council to the SUNY Provost Office, they started looking at, you know, OER as kind of a sustainable, scalable project um, initiative within SUNY and what would be required to make that successful. And, and that led to the development of the SUNY OER services, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, right now. You know, again, the SUNY OER services you know, SUNY Geneseo was instrumental in the development of that program. Um, they were real innovators. They were out front. Um, and we, we took that program and we saw that there was a way to scale those services across the university system. And so right now, the OER services uh, touches at about 60 different campuses within SUNY. So the OER services is a shared service that SUNY institutions can take advantage of. They have free access to, to quality OER, um, but also they get um, you know, access to some professional development and faculty development opportunities. So we work with librarians, we work with instructional designers, we work with faculty to help them understand the best way they can implement OER into the curriculum. Uh, and we help them think through different strategies that they can use on their campuses. Because as you can imagine, the community colleges, I think, were really out front in adopting the OER and using the OER in the curriculum. They, uh, they understood it probably better than most. Um, but then we're starting to see some adoption at uh, a number of our research institutions. But the strategy and the play there is a little bit different than you would at, let's say, a community college. 
And so we help them think through a number of those strategies. When we first started talking about OER, um, we really focused in on the licensing. Um, and we really wanted our faculty members to understand the licensing portion of, of OER. And, and it is important that I don't think we should, we should necessarily gloss over it. Um, but what we also learned is when we talked about the licensing with the OER, we were really kind of making the, the, the argument for OER much more confusing and making it sound more difficult than it really needed to be. Uh, well, of course, we, we worked with the hearts and minds argument about student affordability and everybody pretty much got that. Uh, but when you got into the licensing conversation, I think we probably lost a number of people who would have adopted OER in the early days. In fact, we heard a number of faculty, you know, tell us they were very confused when we would, you know, we described the licensing of, of OER. In fact, I think we made the hoop a little bit too small for them to jump through. Um, and that's something that was, I would categorize that as a missed opportunity. Um, so when we started thinking about what we, what we want to do with our program moving forward, we stopped thinking so much about teaching faculty about licensing. What we wanted to do is really just talk to them about their pedagogy. Um, we also, you know, realized that we weren't going to um, win anybody over if we were telling them how not to use OER. Uh, it's hard to convince somebody to do something if you're just you know, spending time talking about the rules and the dynamics of, of how you play in this space. We really just focused on faculty and what their goals were as teachers. We talked to a number of faculty in SUNY about what they wanted in terms of support for OER and overwhelmingly, you know, they told us they wanted a complete package of curated OER content. They didn't want to spend a lot of time discovering content um, they didn't have time to discover content. They just wanted almost a replacement to what they were getting already from existing publishers. The OER services, here's the catalog, uh, snapshot of the catalog, you know, that's been developed in partnership uh, with a company called Lumen Learning. They're out of Portland, Oregon, and another company or another not-for-profit organization called the Open Learning Initiative out of Carnegie Mellon. Um, they help us think through different strategies about how to not only um, use OER effectively in the classroom, but also the platforms that we can bake that OER into so that we can have better success in terms of student learning outcomes. So when we think about um, the relationship between SUNY, Lumen, and the, and, and, the, and the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon, you know, we think about access increasing in cost coming down but with the oer we're really focused on continuous improvement so we the oer we use with lumen and oli are in personalized learning platforms or adaptive platforms and those adaptive platforms allow faculty to see firsthand how their students are performing in particular courses um, and it always also allows them to see firsthand in real time where students are struggling and if they notice there's a trend where all students are struggling with a particular part of the course, they can make changes to that part of the course because it may be the way they're dis, um, you know, describing the content or describing the subject matter that could be you know, causing students to struggle with the, the overall resources so, or the knowledge of the resources. So you know, this continuous improvement equation really helps lead to more student success. And we really do think more about student success as the overall goal of the OER services. That includes, of course, saving students money, uh, but we really believe it's not only about saving students money, it's about giving them a better educational experience. At the OER services, the platforms we use uh, through, through Lumen uh, is Waymaker and OLI, which is, um, uh, it's a Waymaker product from Lumen Learning and the Open Learning Initiative product called Taurus. That's what we use for our personalized learning. And plus, we have an online homework system. It's called the Online Homework Manager. It's very comparable to like Pearson's My Math Lab. Um, and these are used as affordable solutions 
um, that help faculty with that replacement, give them the same functionality as a lot of the existing content that publishers provide. And what we do is we cover the cost for access. So students don't have to pay for this and faculty get immediate access to, to these, these, these platforms. With, oh, with the OER work though too, we're starting to see a number of faculty get interested in the digital humanities and start to use the digital uh, scholarship framework within their teaching and learning. So while the OER platforms that we use from um, Lumen and OLI, they're great for those let's say gateway courses or the, the first two years of a college learning experience and maybe in some of the remedial courses, we're noticing that the three and 400 level courses, the personalized learning platforms don't work as well. Um, in fact, faculty are, are, are more um, comfortable using functionality like, um, you know, like a, a, a press books, or in this case, it's Candela from Lumen Learning. We also work with uh, Domain in One's Own, and we provide like a, a platform that's uh, based in uh, WordPress um, that allows faculty to kind of develop their course within there, and then also use uh, different plays like open pedagogy so that the, the students themselves can get involved in building some of the, the learning materials. We're looking to try to scale that next. So we've got the personalized learning and the homework um, you know, system in, in, in play, but now we want to start looking more into the digital humanities and digital scholarship. Um, and our libraries are really instrumental in helping us push us this way, because I think libraries understand this space probably better than, than most other groups on a campus. Um, part of uh, my role also is I, I've worked with the University of Buffalo, uh, co-founder of the Open Education Research Lab, um, one of the things that we, I think, are one of the more disappointing pieces of, of the OER space is that the research in itself is somewhat lacking. Um, it, it's improving, it certainly is, and it, it will continue to improve over time. Um, but a lot of the research, I think, to this point has been somewhat, um, uh, you know, the, the theoretical frameworks used and the empirical evidence is, is, is maybe a little bit weak. Um, but it is improving. And I, and one of the goals of the Open Education Research Lab was to really start to understand the impact open education was having within higher education. So that includes OER, but also open access, looking at maker spaces, open badging, really kind of looking at the entire landscape of open education is that has increased in popularity and, and continues to grow in higher ed. Uh, and one of the um, one of the studies we just wrapped up uh, in, in, in the lab, and, and the two papers are right now up for peer review right now, was really looking at uh, how college instructors prepare to teach their courses with OER. So we looked at a lot of research that had already been done that looked at how faculty prepare to teach their courses. We started looking at some of the research that, that kind of investigated what faculty did to prepare um, their courses for teaching with OER, and a lot of that was a little fuzzy to us. So we took a deeper dive in just looking at how faculty prepare to teach their course in general. And, and not surprisingly, um, the majority of faculty, when they do start planning to prepare to teach their course, they always start with content. It's about 85% of the faculty surveyed. Um, and when they look at you know, the way the faculty, um, you know, prepared after they selected the content, they started to see that most faculty generally didn't really seek help outside um, their department. It was mostly an insular process. Sometimes they talked to other faculty, sometimes they didn't. They just talked to the publisher, used the material, put it inside the learning management system, or just made it available in the bookstore, and they're taught their courses because, you know, the publishers have done a fairly good job of making the content easy to teach from. Um, but I think, you know, of course, the, the expense is one thing because I, they're as, the astronomical cost of, of textbooks, I think everybody, you know, that's a foregone conclusion. It just, it's out of reach for so many students. But also, you know, it doesn't allow for the, the flexibility that faculty need to kind of customize and personalize the learning experience for their students. 
Um, so we really started to take a deep dive in understanding how faculty go through that preparation process. Uh, and rarely, if ever, do they really reach out to faculty developers and structural designers or librarians for support. When we started looking at OER, we saw that faculty had a different approach entirely. In fact, when most faculty were, were introduced to the idea of OER, they most almost immediately were seeking some sort of support, uh, almost like a translator, like, can you explain this to me? Uh, so almost immediately that preparation process stopped being so isolated, stopped being so insular. And one of the groups that faculty connected with most frequently were actually librarians. And so librarians almost acted as like brokers or conduits. Uh, on campus that would help a faculty member attack back and forth between instructional design, instructional technology support, as well as getting support for faculty development. All through that process, faculty were starting to learn how they had different opportunities to infuse different learning, teaching and learning strategies in their courses. And then they started working with other faculty members. They started talking to other faculty members who adopted OER. And through those efforts, uh, we started to uh, notice there was a transformation happening uh, with a number of our faculty. In fact, when we interviewed um, uh, about a dozen faculty in SUNY, uh, you know, each one of them, you know, specifically talked about different organizations, different people, uh, different operations that played a huge role in helping them understand, but also transform their teaching. When I say transform their teaching, I, I truly mean trans transformative. A number of faculty talked about how for the first time in like 30 years, they actually feel like they're teaching again. Um, because what they were able to do with OER is different than the, what they were doing with their course materials previously. They could really personalize that learning experience and at the same time, learn from other faculty members about how they approach different subject areas or the same subject area. And from there, there's kind of glean a little bit of um, experience and a little bit of evidence about how an, a colleague may approach a certain subject area or subject matter, and that will inform their own teaching strategies. Um, again, more research has to be done on this. Um, but for the most part, we saw that the OER um, really helped faculty members change their overall preparation and process, and in, in turn, it changed the way they approach their teaching in general. You know, what we saw with a number of a faculty who are in SUNY is that they started working with a librarian or an instructional designer, uh, and this was typically, it happened within their campus community, um, but over time and relatively quickly, um, you know, they, they extended outside their campus community, instead of working with other campuses within SUNY, and then soon after that, they were actually porting to organizations and, and faculty outside the campus community. And so, you know, that's the global nature of OER and probably the real power of OER is that it has a, it acts as a bridge to connect people with each other. And it's beyond just saving students money. I think it's having a tremendous impact on, on college faculty. Now, I know that it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, in higher education, we want to drive down costs and we want to make things more affordable for, for students. And, you know, if you talk to any faculty developer out there, they'll tell you there's no money in faculty development. Like, if you want to get rich, don't become a faculty developer. Um, but I think what, what, what higher education is starting to realize is that investment in faculty development actually helps students in, in not only speeding up time to completion, but also just have better learning experiences in general. I mean, Going back a number of slides, when we talked about enrollment issues in SUNY, I mean, we're at a point now where we just know that's our truth. And I think for a long time, we were trying to understand how we can increase our enrollments. But I think now we're at a point where we're just accepting that that's just a fact and that's a number we can, we have to live with. So what do we do now to make sure that the students that we 
do come to SUNY, choose to come to SUNY, choose to come to our campuses, stay. And I really believe OER is, is an important element in helping them have successful academic careers. And it also means that we have to make sure our, our faculty are having successful academic careers themselves. We've had a number of testimonies from faculty. There's a gentleman, uh, Tori Matthews, former community college uh, professor at Monroe, now at RIT, look him up. Um, you know, he's had just tremendous experience implementing OER. You know, his goal, of course, was just to save students money. Um, but over time, you can just tell he, he I mean, Tori was on fire. It, it not only did, was he saving students money, but he was giving them better learning experiences. And it overall was a better teaching experience for him. And if you ever have an opportunity, talk to Tori. He's one of the more uh, humble human beings you're going to meet and also one of the more inspirational educators I know. Um, Lori Amano from the University of Buffalo, you know, she took a, a large section course. It was about 800 students, if not more, um, who were enrolled, and she used OER inside that course she was teaching with. And what ended up happening is that the students had a better uh, learning experience because it was a student-centered experience. It was no longer just about the content. It was about the students who were, who were sitting in the class. You know, we've had many of, of, of faculty comment about the impact OER has had on their teaching. Uh, and I'm not overselling it here. I really, truly believe if you have the right apparatus in place, again, librarians are key, they're instrumental, uh, but also faculty developers, instructional designers, and networks outside of your own local campus, you know. There's organizations like Lumen and OLI, but there's more. There's like OpenStax. There's LibreText out of UC Davis. There's a number of OER organizations out there that, that a faculty member can choose to work with. And each one of them has their own framework, has their own system to help a faculty member move from teaching with traditional course materials to moving towards OER. And moving towards OER, again, it's about continuous improvement. So always remember, it's about faculty improving their teaching and giving them the support and giving them the time to improve that teaching. You know, I really truly believe that OER is, 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 is really, it's a, it's a big tool for faculty development and faculty development has to be a tool used um, to make for a successful OER program. None of this, I think, is, is feasible or even warranted unless we know it's having an impact on students. And we've had a number of students in SUNY tell us firsthand just the impact OER has had on their lives. You know, it saves students money. And, and as you can imagine, and I'm sure you've run into this at RIT just as you would at any academic campus, there are students who are just struggling financially. And, you know, the fact that a number of these, especially first generation college students can make that, that leap um, into a in, into a, a, a college classroom and make that transition out of the current environment into an academic environment. You know they should not be prohibited by the co the cost of course materials. Tuition is expensive enough, and if we can make that bridge between where they want to be and where they can be much easier, um, I think we should make any every attempt we can. To to, to make that as seamless as humanly possible. Um, we've had a number of adult learners in SUNY come to us and just talk about having to, you know, sacrifice paying the daycare bill to pay for a Pearson textbook. And, you know, it's heartbreaking, but at the same time, it enrages you as an educator because nobody should be left having to make that decision. Because, you know, education, as we all, I would assume, believe, is really the silver bullet that can help people transform their lives entirely. We have seen some of our uh, faculty uh, really work firsthand with our students. I talked about, um, you know, the infusion of the digital humanities about to take off within the OER services. You know, we had a number of faculty start having the students author the textbook using, um, you know, open pedagogy as kind of like the framework for their teaching. Um, and what that meant is that there was, it was less than, you know, it was, 
it wasn't about sage on the stage or even guide on the side. It was about a real community within a course. And it was about what the students could learn together and what the faculty member could learn from those students and what the faculty member could share with the students to help them meet their educational goals within the course. Um, this is a picture right here of my colleague, Jessica Clemens, or Jessica Kruger at the University of Buffalo. You know, Jessica had her students actually write an open textbook. Um, and this was a like a 150, 200 seat uh, lecture course room. I believe it was um, nutrition or dietetics. Well, anyway, um, Jess, um, I, I, and I apologize if she's here, I screwed up your course name. Um, she actually had the students author the textbook each, each week. They would work in groups to come up with the chapters for the final product. Um, and it was one of the more inspiring uh, projects that we saw in the early days of the OER services. Uh, and we're seeing more and more of this show up in SUNY. Um, and it's really because our faculty have an opportunity to expand their creativity into their teaching and the students have an opportunity to expand their creativity into their learning. When we think about our sustainability of OER at SUNY, uh, and it may play differently at, 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 at RIT or any of your other institutions. You know, we think of system level partnerships. We first began this with, um, you know, SUNY Geneseo and the Open SUNY Textbook Project. And we started to work with other groups as well. Uh, Open SUNY, which is now SUNY Online, we started working with them and helping to develop, uh, you know, a way that we could partner with online learning. Um, and they help us with a lot of the uh, a lot of the technical requests that come in from campuses and from students. We also work with our SUNY Press, and SUNY Press has really helped us think through the actual uh, creation of of learning resources and learning materials. Because there's a reason publishers charge money. I don't think they have to charge as much, but that's for another conversation. Um, and SUNY Press really helped us think through the dynamics of developing quality educational resources um, that, you know, that all students could use. Again, the OER services is, 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 is an organization that's going to continue to grow and expand. Again, looking at the digital humanities and digital scholarship, we think that's going to be a big play moving forward. Um, and our SUNY uh, Center for Professional Development, this is all grounded in faculty development. The Center for Professional Development has been key. Um, they, they provide programming that helps our faculty understand not only how to infuse OER in their curriculum, but how to make their courses more equitable, how they can make their courses, um, you know, develop a sense of belonging inside the course so that students feel like they belong inside the course you're teaching. And the flexibility of OER allows us to make sure that the content is reflective of the students who are taking the class and is more I'd say align to the actual history of the human timeline as opposed to the, the timeline that we often, oftentimes see in some white centric uh, course materials that have been, you know, shopped around for a number of years. We also work with a number of uh, groups outside of, of SUNY. You know, we've worked with Lumen Learning and the Open Learning Initiative. We also worked with an organization called Faculty Guild that does you know, large scale faculty development, faculty guild no longer exists. And so that moved over to Lumen Learning and Lumen now has something called the Lumen Circles, which has kind of taken over the faculty guild uh, model. So we work with the CPD and also um, Lumen Circles in, in hopes of expanding offerings to faculty so that they can have a more reflective community uh, oriented um, type of uh, experience when they think through their teaching and learning styles. Um, the RPK group is another one that's really helped us think through sustainability, really helped us think through the importance of getting to robust data so we can do some quantitative analysis and have a better understanding of the impact OER is having in our courses. Again, right now we're looking at the data. It's, it's for the most part quite positive. Um, but we need to improve our data infrastructure so we can even, you know, tell that SUNY OER story even a little bit louder to a broader audience. Again, when we think about the sustainability of OER, 
I really think libraries are at, the, are at the key of this. They are really the bridge between external partnerships, the system level partnerships in SUNY or campus level partnerships, and also the cross campus partnerships. So that's something that I think OER has really shown us is, you know, being in a university system, it, it kind of goes without saying that you would see some collaboration amongst all 64 campuses. I mean, it's unbalanced at times. It's not as uh, not as smooth sailing as one might think. Um, but the collaboration outside of SUNY campuses with other state institutions and with institutions outside of New York State, that's when we're starting to see real transformation takes place with our faculty and the way they teach. But also that transformation needs to take place into student learning. You know, developing a better educational uh, product uh, for our students is probably going to have to be a real focus as we move forward. I think one thing we learned with this pandemic is that the playing field is definitely unbalanced. Um, and in order to, to make it more balanced, I believe public higher education in particular needs to really start focusing more on their end product so that our students have a richer learning experience. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, that's my email address, mark.mcbride at suny.edu. That's my Twitter handle, although I'm slowly starting to rethink my whole social media footprint. Uh, I deleted Facebook about a year ago, and I think I'm a better person for it. And so <laughs> Twitter, you might be next. So well, let's see what happens. But I, you know, at this time, I'm ready to field any questions you might have. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for sharing all these thoughts. And I, I was writing some notes down too. And I love that you pointed out it started about being just about textbook accessibility and affordability. And then it really turns into thinking all about how people design their courses and build community in classroom and then building community far beyond the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I do want to invite, if anyone has a question, you're welcome to type it into the q and I believe because we're in a webinar format. I don't believe that anyone can unmute themselves directly to ask a question. Um, people can also, uh, you can ask questions anonymously or you have the ability in the chat bar just to send questions to the panelists. So if you do not want to type in the Q&A, you can send it to one of us and we um, can read it out loud. So maybe I'll start off by asking a question while other people are thinking about one and potentially ready to pose one. Um, so I did want to ask, you mentioned OER courses in terms of student mm -hmm. thinking about which classes are really built around open from the get-go. Are those marketed in the course catalog? Like, so can students actually see when they're registering for classes, mm -hmm. this is an open class? Or is it just kind of on the back end for you to think about, you know, when you're assessing this was an open class and this one wasn't, and how do people do in it? So I'm just curious to learn more about who can see if this is an open class. So, uh, Kayla, that's a great question. And so my answer is yes, no, and maybe. So um, because we're 64 campuses, there's enough autonomy at the campuses that some have been uncomfortable designating open courses because they're afraid that students will, you know, bypass the non-open courses for the open courses. Now, other campuses are very transparent about, about it. When a student registers for a course, they know which courses are, are open. Um, some label them OER, some just label them affordable because they don't want to take the time to explain OER to, to a student. Um, and, and some are, are a little bit more fuzzy on it. They sometimes designate it as open if a faculty member is comfortable with it. Um, but it has been one of those issues, Caitlin, I think that I think our faculty are starting to come around to the idea that a student is going to select the courses they take based probably on, on their time and actually on their, their pathway to graduation. And whether it's open or not is not always a determining factor. Um, so I think we're going to start seeing uh, a more comfort level with that. Uh, but we code the courses inside of our student information systems. Most of our campuses are on banner. Thanks so much for sharing about that. I did get a question in the um, chat asking, how do you deal with potentially a knee-jerk response of someone who's not on board with this yet that might be saying, this is just another textbook. It's like any other textbook. Or what about my academic freedom to design my own class? You just want me to throw in these already built materials. So what, what responses would you have to people who are hearing this and already leaning into thinking that? 
Yeah, I mean, I love the academic freedom one because actually to me, the OER is where the academic freedom comes to play. And so, you know, if a faculty member, let's say, you know, they're used to teaching with a, a particular textbook, even one they authored, right? Um, they really do not have the legal right to make changes to the to that course material. Now, they may do it inside their learning management system or, or do it on their own with a course reader or somewhere in their syllabus. You know, I, I'm not going to investigate any of that, but, you know, legally they shouldn't be making changes to the materials themselves. With OER, the faculty member has the freedom to make the choices they want to make. One thing I always advise faculty is you can make the choices with the OER you want to make, but make sure you're talking to an instructional designer or a faculty developer or another faculty member. You know, it's always good to vet some of the decision making processes we have when we make changes to our courses or changes to anything really. Um, and I think with teaching and learning, it's, it's, it's critical that, you know, if you're going to make you know, changes and customize the course materials for your classes, you, you vet them with, with colleagues who, you know, who have similar teaching experiences or s similar life experiences, just so that you're making sure that the course materials you're using are accessible intellectually to your students. You know, you're the content expert. Nobody's ever going to doubt that. Um, but where pedagogy is concerned, there are people who have really spelt their, spent their careers truly understanding the best way people learn. Um, and it's always good to just vet some decision making with those people. And it's more of a collaboration than it is just, a, again, an insular process. It's like the, the, the course preparation process I described before, Caitlin. You know, when you keep it insular, I think it limits your ability to make really big changes inside your class. And, and honestly, for the most part, our faculty, when they have that opportunity to go through faculty development, for the most part, they'll take it. I mean, you're always going to have the people that put up the wall and don't want to hear any more about OER or hear about an open textbook, and that's fine. Some of those people eventually come back um, or or never show up again, and that's fine too. You know, it's their choice. It's their profession, however they want to do it. But I really think, you know, look for the people who are just kind of wondering if this is right for them or not. And let them slowly make changes. Let them be an iteration. They don't have to go, you know, full swing at, at the first stop. You know, you can just make small changes over time. And in turn, I think it's going to be a better, richer teaching experience for them. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, I, I think that's one thing for all of us to remember, too, is that you don't have to switch your entire course to be open. You take one lab activity or one reading assignment yep. and just assign that excerpt as being from an open textbook or being an open activity. We do have a question in the Q&A. I think that builds really nicely off of that, which is on one hand saying it may be a time saver, but there's also a lot of time and energy involved in reviewing this existing material. And so um, Bonnie asked a question in the Q&A that um, conscious of the idea of that adopting OER materials can come with a significant time and energy investment. And so in your conversations with faculty, how do they tend to see the balance when, when evaluating if OER is for them and how? No, I mean, Bonnie, you, you're, you've said something that we had a very difficult time addressing in the early days, and that's why we built the uh, curated catalog because we, we knew that the, those materials were vetted. Uh, we knew that they had been reviewed um, and, you know, they were high quality materials. And so we presented them to our faculty uh, with confidence and our faculty in turn, you know, took time to review the materials, but not as deeply as maybe they would let uh, a traditional open textbook, you know. I, you know, and this, and I don't say this with any disrespect to my faculty colleagues, really. And, you know, you, you, you buffer your statement, your next statement with this, right, Caitlin? So, you know, how many faculty really spend a long time investigating, you know, the college textbooks they taught with? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a number of them did, but I talked to a, a, a few of our OER faculty and for the most part, they didn't spend a lot of time reviewing the content from Pearson and McGraw Hill. I think it was a foregone conclusion. They believed it was quality material because of where it came from. Um, and, and they're right to think that way. Yeah, I would say that you probably get the same thing from Lumen or OLI. They take time. They, 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 they use content developers to really, un, to really ensure that the materials are quality. And you get, 
similar results from organizations like OpenStax, you know. I think in the early days, OER, it was just about building open content and getting it out into the ecosystem. And there were some quality issues. And, you know, we weren't publishers, you know. The idea of higher education taking back the publishing landscape, you know, that's a tall order we're setting for ourselves. Um, but over time, I think we've learned in, the, in, in our OER work, and I think this is globally that we learned, that, you know, there is that opportunity uh, to, to use resources that come from organizations like the Lumens, the OLIs, the, the OpenStax, the Open Textbook Network out of Minnesota, or even like Milne Open Textbook at Geneseo. You know, this is content that's been reviewed. It's quality materials that, that, that a faculty member can confidently use. And again, going back, if you don't want to do it all full, you know, full swoop at first, take one chapter, take two chapters and, and just, you know, embed that into your course and see if that meets your teaching needs. Um, cause I think it'll benefit you, especially when you can customize it and, and really make it about the way you like to deliver the content and the way you prefer to teach the content. Thanks so much for sharing that. I did want to add, um, because Francis and I were, were typing in the chat to each other before, that Francis here at the RIT Libraries has developed an info guide that includes curated resources of OER. And so I think that will also hopefully potentially address um, some of that question and concern about where can I make sure that I don't have to sift through the entire internet to find high quality resources to potentially use for class. I'm curious, Mark, maybe building off of this, does that list of materials also include traditional publishers that are now publishing open? So, for example, as I'm thinking about this, I know that mm. MIT Press, for example, is now publishing some of their books as open materials. And so I know even when my department was talking about this event, my department chair has a book out and her publisher made it open. And so those are conversations that are maybe not even just about textbooks. So there are other materials that our traditional academic publishers are now making open. So are people in the SUNY system also finding those? Yeah, we are. I mean, that's really funny you mentioned that particular topic because I was on the I was on a call with uh, the director of our SUNY Press this morning, um, and he's looking at which is about the open monographs and building open books and, and adding them to the ecosystem. You know, we have a number of open um, monographs within SUNY uh, that we're starting to publish and a number that are actually out there available. Um, we don't make those available in the catalog yet. I think over time, as we start to think more about the digital humanities and think about digital scholarship, we'll start to expand, you know, the the purview of our faculty um, and what they can see is terms is accessible, you know. But the early days of, of the OER services, we were really laser focused on that high enrollment general education courses. And actually, I should have mentioned this before. That was the actual legislation that came from New York State. So. That's how we had to use the $4 million. So we wanted to keep the legislator happy in, in hopes that they would come back with another $4 million every year. Um, but you bring up a good point because I think publishers are moving into this space. Again, check the licensing just to verify that it's actually openly licensed. I think Michigan is making moves in this space. I know MIT, John Hopkins, um, North Georgia Press. Um, I think especially university presses are starting to see that open access and OER is a future business model that they have to start thinking about um, because it meets the needs of their, their faculty authors, um, but also it helps expand their readership. I mean, if anybody's an open access advocate thinking about traditional, you know, scholarly research that's, that's authored as open access, the readership for open access is through the roof. It's like sometimes two or three times more than a traditional you know, closed journal access uh, publication is. I think the same is true for open monographs and open textbooks. You just get more readership because there's more availability. So it just, it's kind of a foregone conclusion if there's, if, 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 if the bridge to availability is wide open, you know, you're going to have more people go to walking down that bridge and getting access to the materials. Well, that's reminding me of sort of my, my next question I was writing down as you were sharing, which was I was curious if SUNY faculty, in part because of the initiatives that you're talking about, are incentivized or if it's part of their own um, 
review materials or things in their annual review, that sort of thing for lecturers or faculty mm. for writing and sharing open materials. That actually part of, you know, you mentioned there's this incentive in the broader community that if you make your materials open, it can be shareable, but creating your own open materials also takes time and energy, not just adopting it. And so has the SUNY system or any SUNY campuses set up incentives in that direction? Um, or is it more about adopting the materials versus creating them and wanting, you know, the, the people working in the SUNY system to be the creators of open materials that are being used by other campuses all around the country and the world? No, that's a good question. So um, a number of our faculty um, who have authored open textbooks um, have taken on this work. Um, uh, you know, they've done it out of um, a passion for the project, but then we also seek ways to compensate them. So the IITG, the Innovative Instruction Technology Grant, was, was kind of important in those early days. Um, also, with some of the OER funding, we realized there were big gaps in the ecosystem. So we funded a number of our campuses to build their own content. Um, and, and we were excited to see those projects come to fruition, but they were really unbalanced. Um, and I think this is where the SUNY Press kind of pointed to us, pointed out to us that, you know, publishing content is a little bit more complicated than just sitting down and, and, and taking pen to paper, right? There's a lot that goes into the, the authoring process and also the publishing and delivery process. Um, so, you know, as far as authoring uh, course materials or authoring open monographs or open textbooks, you know, we have some faculty to identify um, funding through their campus, sometimes through the system office, but it's not a real focus of ours. Um, we do see a number of campuses, though, starting to add open educational resources into the promotion and tenure review process. So not only faculty that are authoring open content, but also faculty who are teaching with OER. Because as you can imagine, adopting an open or adopting a, a traditional textbook, you've been teaching this way for about 10 years. You know, I'm not saying that you're just on autopilot, but you know, you know the process you need to go to to get your course ready for the next semester when you're teaching with, you know, the same textbook from the semester before, or even if it's a different publisher's textbook. With OER, it's a different animal altogether, as I described. You know, you're working with different people just to educate yourself. Um, and then, you know, those people are helping you to kind of prepare your courses to implement the OER. So there's a lot more work up front. Um, and our faculty are beginning to see that that needs to be recognized as scholarly activity. That needs to be recognized as, let's say, publishing or teaching. Um, and it's it's going into a number of promotion and tenure, um, you know, policies that we're seeing on campuses, uh, the departmental level, sometimes at the campus level. Um, there's also a lot of groups who are working on that. And I'll share a resource afterwards. There's a group called Doers, which is like a, a, a collection of system uh, offices that have gotten together to really investigate OER. There was a great report they did on promotion and tenure, and they've actually developed like a framework for how you can assess um, open educational resources in the promotion and tenure process, which I think is great because, you know, a number of times I think our faculty are investing so much time in the teaching and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't factor as highly in the, in the review process. And, you know, we might have to start rethinking that, that, that framework, that methodology altogether. Knowing that I'm not a faculty member, I'm starting to step into like the, the, the an area that I'm not comfortable talking about. Um, but I'll, but I would say that a number of our faculty are starting to think of OER as a, is, is something valuable to their, their teaching portfolio and therefore should go into the promotion and tenure portfolio. Thanks for sharing about that. Uh, we do have a question in the Q&A and um, it might be one that maybe we need to follow up after, but um, okay. Stephen Jacobs, who is leading open at RIT here at RIT is asking um, if you have any references about greater readership on open access materials. So I'm sure that would be of interest to share and promote about open here on our campus too. And so okay. if you have any in mind now, otherwise um, that might be an area where if you know of a reference afterwards, maybe we can connect the two of you. Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. And I, I just want to make sure that we get the question right. Is, is looking at the research on, on OER or mm -hmm. just in general? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. 
I think this was your comment before was about the fact that right, if people are sharing open materials, there mm-hmm. seems to be evidence, at least yeah. for open journals, right, that that those are more highly read and potentially cited than other materials. And so more information about that if you have that information. Yeah. So I yes, see that. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So I I have a I actually have a somewhat of a small bibliography we used when we uh, went through our last Elsevier negotiation. I'll be happy to share that with you. Thank you. So I'm sure that that's of, of interest to know. Yeah. So for people who are considering, especially faculty, right, they're having conversations, like you mentioned, if they're switching or considering switching to open materials for their course, they're potentially not just talking to subject matter experts like people in their department or around their college. They're then talking with instructional design folks. So for example, here at RIT, that might be our ILI group or the librarians. So what are the kind of the steps or the things that you would introduce someone who's brand new to OER? What would you tell them mm-hmm. to consider as they're thinking through this? Okay, uh, let me think through that. And so there are probably people who are much better to answer this than me. Um, I, I think the, the, the first thing I, I would do is actually, um, I'd want to talk to the faculty member um, about their, either their learning outcomes or what their expectations are. So, you know, if they're interested in OER, uh, you know, what are their expectations? Are, are they expecting they're going to find an open textbook that's going to meet all their needs? You know, at that, I might ask them to manage their expectations because, you know, that that may not exist. We, you know, may take some time for us to discover content. Um, also, you know, if it's a faculty member who's teaching, again, like a, a high enrollment general education course or, or, or a course where I know there's good quality curated material, um, I would not only connect them with the resource, but I'd also connect them with an instructional designer or a faculty developer or even a, like a librarian who's really knowledgeable in that particular domain to kind of walk them through not only the, the materials, but the overall implementation. I think you know, when we talk to our faculty, and I, I never thought this was, was going to be a real issue, the implementation of the OER, like how to get it into their course, whether they're using a learning management system or developing their own web page, however, they, that was a big issue. And a number of them, um, you know, had concerns about, you know, if, you know, with a, with a, with the textbook, it's easy. It's sitting at the it's sitting at the campus store, or even with the software package, it's easy. It's sitting there. A student gets access. They can start using the material right away. You know, how does that work for OER? And being able to walk them through the mechanics of access, I think, helps faculty also make that leap because you're asking them to enter into something they haven't done before. Um, and anytime you walk into something you've never done before. You have a lot of questions, there's a lot of uncertainty. So, you know, cover all those bases. And then, you know, again, take a look at the learning outcomes and, you know, and get and get them to, you know, share what their expectations are for their students and then for themselves, what they want to see at the end of the semester. And then, you know, like a backwards design, just walk them through that process and, and think about how to build the, the, the course starting at the end until you get very, you know, back to the beginning again and just kind of walk them through the entire learning, you know, teaching architecture process. This is where, you know, sometimes starting the small bites of the apple work, you know, if, a, if you just want to change the lab, you know, or if you just want to, you know, change, you know, the introductory of the course or any particular part of the course, you know, that might be the easiest way. Um, to help faculty get comfortable with the change. I do want to remind everyone that you're welcome to type questions into the chat or into the Q&A function. Um, otherwise, I'm going to keep asking questions, which I'm happy to do. Um, I did want to share a question that I didn't see come up in, in your materials, but I think maybe you can open up, up to the door of sort of talking about potential downsides, not to be a downer, but to think about being prepared in advance, right? So anticipating a potential challenge in hopes mm-hmm. of potentially, um, you know, adapting in advance to it. And so one thing I've noticed in particular with maybe lab activities, not necessarily an OER textbook, is that I've talked with fellow faculty, especially science faculty, and they're concerned that if it's open, that the answer key is available. 
And so thinking about right. um, how do I make sure if this is an open material that anyone can access, that the students are going to work through the material in the way that I want them to, uh, because if it's fully open, then the answer key is somewhere out there in terms of thinking about um, what what we want them to do or what we're hoping they're going to find. And so have you had those conversations with faculty at all and help them kind of work through that? Yeah, uh, that's come up a number of times. And so um, so with Lumen and OLI, they actually, um, they, they, they keep the assessments behind, let's say the garden wall uh, until somebody adopts the course and then you get access to it. Um, and, and that's primarily because you know, a number of faculty were concerned about students having access to the assessment uh, or the quizzes and, and being able to, you know, kind of get a sneak peek and, and, and you know, conduct some like <laughs> high tech surveillance uh, cheating. Right. Um, but I also would say that, you know, if if we don't think students who are committed to finding assessments from publishers or from anybody else out there, uh, if you don't think that they, they know where to go and how to get there, uh, I think we're fooling ourselves. I mean, there are just so many different paths to get to that information. I mean, some are, you know, you can find that on, on, on Reddit. Some of it you can find on, you know, just a BitTorrent. Some of it you can find inside a GitHub. I mean, there is, and there's actually some organizations that have actually made a profit making those assessments available uh, to, to students. And, you know, I, I've always thought that, you know, if a student is is committed to, to kind of like, uh, let's say, for lack of a better term, cheating in their course, they're going to go ahead and do that. Um, so I don't think that should stop anybody from using an, an OER. However, I would also say that, you know, what OER allows you to do is to rethink your assessment process too, and maybe think of different ways to assess student learning. Maybe it all doesn't have to be a summative or formative type of assessment. Maybe there's other ways you can assess students. And, you know, I'm really interested in things like open assessment. I'm really interested in, um, in, in understanding, you know, how to measure student learning beyond the traditional assessment. Uh, and I know there's a lot of educational research out there that that's investigating this. It's in its infancy, but you know I think uh, the the question of of the assessment that comes in from faculty, I think the best way to answer it, if they're very concerned about it, is you know you can keep the assessment under lock and key until they're comfortable uh, with you know with with adopting the OER. But then you maybe have you know questions and conversations about. The nature of assessment after you know you 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 get over that milestone. Yeah, I think you. I think it's a great reminder that right. It sort of opens up all these possibilities, which can be both freeing and maybe scary about rethinking the whole course, right, and all the right. goals, right. So I've just I, I wanted to bring that up because that's one that I've certainly heard faculty share concerns about when thinking about some specific activities that aren't just about um, a textbook. Um, one of the questions that I personally am interested in, especially as lots of OER materials are online and we've had lots of flexible and variable and mixed mode formats in the last, of course, two years. I'm sure SUNY campuses have also, right, as we adapt to the ongoing pandemic, is thinking about the accessibility of online materials for teaching. Mm -hmm. And so, especially here at RIT, we, we have a really diverse student body. Um, and so this is, I know, something our campus is thinking about more, more broadly is are the materials that we hope students are working with going to be accessible to the diversity of learners that we have? So is that anything that you have insights to share from your campus system experience for us to know and learn about? Well, you know, it's it's interesting you talk about, uh, 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 you know, accessibility because, you know, with with Lumen and OLI, and in particular those two organizations, the reason why we, we partnered with them, and there's a lot of reasons, but one of the more important reasons is because of accessibility. This is something they take really seriously, and they work with organizations to make sure that the materials meet the accessibility requirements of the highest standards. Um, but also, you know, we've started to, you know, weave diversity, equity, and inclusion into our faculty development programs, which is another form, well, I would say, is a, of, of accessibility and thinking about the overall belonging inside of a course. Um, because, you know, we know that organizations, big and small, 
the diversity of the organization equates to the richness and the depth of the organization. And th that, that holds true for a classroom too. So just the diverse student body and the diversity of experiences that are, that are gonna be shared inside that classroom, all can be reflected in the OER when you have the flexibility to customize it to meet the needs of the students that are that are taking your classes, um, and I, you know, I think accessibility of digital content I think is critical. Uh, we learned that during the pandemic, we had students who had accessibility issues. You know, we just we thought we were really well prepared for it, and we realized we were a few steps further behind than we thought we were, and we really had to step it up a notch. Um, the work with Lumen and OLI has been kind of so important, especially the last couple of years, because they have taken that to heart and invested a lot into making sure that their content remains accessible. And I would say that um, for the most part, their material has has really um, reached the highest standards of accessibility and has surpassed anything that Pearson, McGraw, Hill, or Wiley, and I'm not here to bash publishers, but you know those big organizations and I'm sitting inside of a big organization it takes a lot of nerve for us to move the needle at all I think the same holds true for those those big three publishers that I mentioned uh, where a company like OLI and Lumen you know it's easier for them to adjust and move on the fly and to meet the needs of the students um, that are that are in higher education today and not be thinking about you know how much something costs or think about, you know, well, you know, do we get the right sign off at the CEO level? It's just kind of baked into their culture and, and therefore it's kind of baked into ours. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Because certainly it's, um, we have specific policies at RIT, for example, about things like captioning. And so I don't know if people in the SUNY system are using video-based materials that are open, but those are things that we certainly hear at RIT we need to be thinking about in terms of adopting materials and thinking about how we might need to adapt them if you were going to use them. So it's good to know that some of these open publishers that you're already working with, these partnerships are already thinking about that proactively because those are would affect the ability for someone like me as faculty to say, can I use this immediately? Or do right. I need to wait until next year because I actually need to get you know this material changed or made more accessible before I could use it in my class. So that's really great. To know. Um, so again, I don't want to mention downsides in the sense of being against open, but in terms of thinking about preparing faculty, are there any other sort of big concerns, either in terms of myths or things that, that you have to help faculty work through that you could just share with us so that people can anticipate that as a potential challenge or as a potential um, maybe misunderstanding about what might be a challenge but isn't really? Uh, I mean, I think one of the one of the things that has been a challenge and it continues to be a challenge is that you know the the freeness of oer or the low cost nature of the oer immediately um you know creates skepticism with a faculty member because you know they oftentimes believe if it's free or low cost it must be less than the expensive um, material you know and that's like behavioral economics 101 um, I believe that actually Daniel Kahneman at, 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 at University of Rochester actually started exploring that area um, years ago. Um, what we've learned, and we did some of this research at, at UB, is that um, for the most part, students and faculty found the OER to be equal or sometimes better than traditional course materials. And that skepticism that they had um, really was found to be, you know, without merit. Um, it's natural to be skeptical about something that's free or low cost. I mean, if somebody offered you a, you know, a free car or one that costs $50,000, you're immediately going to think the $50,000 car is worth more or, or, or a better value, I should say, regardless if, if, it, if it's, you know, mechanics are the same or even better. So I think the same holds true with OER. I don't think that that particular Arguments going to go away anytime soon, but there's lots of research out there about you know the financial skepticism of all we are. You know, I I wrote a I wrote a paper with uh, with my colleague Sam Abravovich at the University of Buffalo. There's countless of research studies that have been done on that, um, and they all hold up and they all say the same thing that for the most part 
students and faculty identify the OER to be equal or the same as traditional course materials. Well, that's great to know. And definitely we were, Francis and I were checking a little bit about, I hope we can share some of these links that you were talking all about today. So yes. even as you were sharing, I was looking up the open textbook reference. And so I hope that we can also share the link to your um, research group so that people can learn more about all the things that you're finding um, sure. to help us understand and anticipate those challenges. So not to put Francis on the spot, but I do hope that we can make sure to send people those links because the Q&A format means I can't just type them into, ch into the chat for everyone to see right now. Um, so I think there's a couple of different announcements that I believe my librarian colleagues want to share before our time is over today. So I just want to ask if anyone else had any remaining questions for our guest speaker today. And if not, I want to turn it over to my colleagues to share and wrap us up. So I don't see any questions coming through immediately right now, um, but I'll also share, right, thank you, Mark, that you also shared your contact information, and so we can make sure that people know uh, where to find you after this, and we really appreciate you sharing. I'm so excited to hear about how it's going for the SUNY system and think brainstorm more possibilities for us here on campus, and so thank you again for sharing with us today. Uh, I was happy to be here, and, and I would also advise all my colleagues at RIT to track down Tori Matthews, because you'll get probably one of the more inspirational conversations you've had with an educator in a long time. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mark and Caitlin, for that discussion. Um, I think it was very informative. Um, hey, Mark, if you can just send me like a lot of the, some of the links of the things you referenced, and then if you have any other resources, um, like uh, the uh, references Stephen Jacobs was asking about, I can shoot an email out to everybody uh, with that. And did you want to share your slides as well? I can do all that. Okay. So, um, yep, I guess if I'll expect an email from us with some follow-up uh, references, and then uh, we will be putting this on YouTube in the coming probably a few weeks um and I'll, I'll put the links in the description for that as well once we get that up but um yeah thank you everybody for attending and thank you again mark and galen <laughs> <laughs>